I challenge my friends to hunt me down. And destroy me. Nope, 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 that, oh, that, no, that's no. not gonna happen. That's not gonna happen. You're already getting us in trouble. Sorry. I challenge my friends to track me down with a homing device that I created myself. But first, some context. All right, this does not belong here. <sighs> Thanks. This is Goldfinger. Yeah, this is my favorite part. And turn to the right just ahead here somewhere. Oh, I hate this homing device. It's so ridiculous. What? This is great. How can you hate it? This homing device is acting like a GPS tracker. Yeah. They didn't have GPS back then. This is completely unrealistic. It's just a movie. Yeah, but other movies handle this better. What? Show me. Take a look at this scene from No Country for Old Men. Oh, that's lame. That's how an actual homing device works. Yeah, but that's just a bunch of beeping. That would never work in real life. You wanna bet? Do you have a homing device? No, but I think I know how to build one. In this two-part video series, I'll first show you how different trackers work. Then I'll show you how I'm able to build my own homing device. And I'll test it out by giving it to my friends and challenging them to hunt me down as I run from them. But enough talk, more data. It's data time. A homing device or radio tracker is actually a lot less sophisticated than it's portrayed in Goldfinger. So what's the issue with the device in the movie? Well, the tracking device is first introduced to us by Q as a Homer transmitter. Here's a nice little transmitting device called a Homer. You prime it by pressing that back like this. But then Q shows the receiver in a car, which looks a lot like a GPS tracker. So the homing device can't really provide its position, only its distance from the receiver. It is providing its distance. Yeah, but later in the movie, we see Bond place the transmitter on someone getting into a car. Then Felix tracks that car as he's able to determine what direction the transmitter is turning. And turn to the right, just ahead here somewhere. How did Felix know the car was turning right? What's more, how does he have a map on his console? That would mean he also has a transmitter that knows its own location in relation to the surrounding area. Is that so crazy? Well, earlier in the movie, we see that when Bond is using the tracker from his car in England, the map on his console shows he's at South End Airport. Then he flies to Switzerland and the console updates the map with that of Geneva. This looks like a much more advanced system than just a simple transmitter receiver homing device. So how do real trackers work? Let's take a look at an example I'm more familiar with from the world of aviation. Planes have been navigating since long before GPS, and one way to determine range from a target is from distance measuring equipment. These DMEs can be used to determine the distance between an aircraft and a known ground target using some kind of radio beacon. The pilot looks at their aeronautical chart and sees a beacon that they want to track. The chart publishes the radio frequency that the pilot can tune into. The aircraft sends a unique sequence of signals that the ground station receives, and then after a precise delay, maybe 50 milliseconds, the ground station applies with the exact same sequence of signals that the aircraft receives. The delay between the send and the receive is recorded, and since radio waves travel at a known and consistent velocity, the speed of light, we can calculate the slant range between the aircraft and the ground station. What is slant range? The distance between the aircraft and ground station on a map isn't the same as it would be in the air, depending on the plane's altitude. But in general, this gives the pilot really useful information, unless the plane is right on top of the ground station. It's also important to note that these stations usually only have a range of about 45 miles for low altitude aircraft, whereas Q claims his transmitter has a much longer range. Auto visual range 150 miles. But crucially, this does not give the pilot any directional information, just distance. It also only works because the ground beacon is stationary at a known location on the map. The pilot's not pursuing a moving target. So then, how do pilots know what direction to fly? For that, let's look at very high frequency omnidirectional range stations. What? 
Very high frequency omnidirectional range, or VOR, is one of the simplest ways for pilots to get information about what direction to fly. In this example, the ground station indicates the bearing to the station from the plane. So if the station was here and an airplane over here wanted to know its bearing to the station, it would get a bearing of 90 degrees from the station. Then the pilot knows that if they fly a reverse bearing of 270 degrees, the plane will travel to the beacon. This is actually a very helpful tool for pilots to fly to their destination, especially if their destination has a radio beacon there. Most airports have these radio beacons installed for just this reason. Oh, so see, you can get direction from a radio beacon. Yeah, but this only works with a static ground station. A VOR station is built to align with magnetic north, so it knows its orientation in the world. The VOR station sends out an omnidirectional pulse 30 times a second. In between each pulse, it sends a rotating directional pulse in a synchronized manner, such that the omnidirectional pulse is sent at the same moment the directional pulse is transmitting north. The aircraft receives both signals and and depending on the delay between them, can determine its orientation in relation to the station. Essentially, it's using time as an analog for direction. Okay, so see, you could imagine that Bond is using this type of directional beacon to locate the transmitter. VOR only works because the ground station is fixed and it knows which way is north. Bond puts the transmitter in someone's pocket haphazardly and then that person sits in the car. They probably aren't facing north and the transmitter might not even be the right side up. It also doesn't look like it has any rotating parts. So there's no way that transmitters in the 1960s could have worked? Well, there are some other options that might be more plausible. Maybe they could have used a directional antenna. How would that work? A directional antenna allows you to receive radio transmissions, but only from one direction. Basically, you point the receiver in the direction you want to receive transmissions from. Maybe Q outfitted the Aston Martin with a directional receiver that could rotate until it detected the signal, and then the car would know what direction the transmitter was in relation to the direction of the car. I don't see a rotating antenna on the car, but maybe it's inside the car? We also see Felix use it in his Thunderbird, so then his CIA car would presumably also need to be outfitted with this antenna. More importantly, we see that the console is aligned to north, but the directional antenna would only know how to show a relative bearing from the direction of the car. Well, wouldn't the car have a compass in it in order to align the map to north? I suppose, but that brings up another issue, the map. How does the car know where it is in the region? What do you mean? Bond's Aston Martin knows it's in Southland on Sea. Then, when Bond flies to Switzerland, the console knows it's in Geneva. Then Felix's Thunderbird knows it's in Kentucky. A simple transmitter-receiver pair doesn't know where it is in the world. Did Bond have maps of those areas preloaded into the car? This sounds a lot more complex. Is there no way that the car could have known that? Well, there is one option I can think of, which is probably the most plausible option they could have used, but it's also the most complex. It's similar to GPS, but without the satellites. They could have used triangulation. How does that work? Triangulation is probably one of the most ubiquitous forms of tracking, and it can be used with simple transmitters. However, the receiver is a more complex system. So far, we've just been looking at simple transmitter-receiver pairs. But what if there was actually a lot more technology used in creating this tracking system? What if the car didn't have a receiver at all? What if multiple receivers were placed around the region, and each of them could determine their distance from the transmitter? With enough receivers, you could triangulate the position of the transmitter. Imagine you have one DME receiver that gives you its distance to the transmitter. Essentially, it knows that the transmitter is somewhere on this circle. If I have another receiver over here, then it knows the transmitter is somewhere on this circle. And with a third receiver, I know that the transmitter is somewhere on this circle. The intersection of these three circles gives us one location, which is the location of the transmitter. This is triangulation, and with a large enough network, it can give you your location across an entire region. In fact, it can even determine the location of satellites in orbit. Then, those satellites can act as receivers for other transmitters on the ground and triangulate their position. And now, you have a global positioning system, which is basically the GPS we use today. So then it is possible. If you had a network of receivers based in England and in Switzerland and in the US that could synchronize their pulses and communicate their telemetry to the car, then yes, I think that would work. So then it works. I'm just a bit skeptical that this was really that feasible at the time. It's a movie, it's not supposed to be feasible. Yes, but I wanna go back to No Country for Old Men. I think that movie really does do a good job of showing a more accurate approach to a simple transmitter receiver homing device. Yeah, but that's unrealistic. How would you even be able to track someone with just distance? 
I'll show you. If the transmitter is stationary and you have some patience, you could move around and eventually you could home in on the target. It's like playing a game of warm or colder. Also, it's important to note that if you're searching for someone, you probably already suspect other things like maybe they're hiding in a motel. The transmitter just becomes one additional tool that helps the pursuer deduce the location of their target. I don't think this would actually work in real life. I bet I could build my own transmitter receiver. Really? Yep, and that's what I did. I built my own app that acts like a transmitter receiver, and I challenged my friends to hunt me down just like Javier Bardem hunts down Josh Brolin, but without the killing. So how do you even build your own tracker? Well, to be frank, I wasn't able to build an actual radio transmitter. It's just not that feasible. However, these days, virtually everyone I know has a tracker in their pocket with GPS. You said you didn't want to use GPS. I know, but I can use GPS in order to approximate a radio transmitter. How do you do that? I'll show you. When we think of GPS, we think of a map with a dot on it indicating our location, and maybe another dot with our destination, and maybe lines to connect them with our route. But what if instead we just provide a number, the distance between you and the target? Can you do that with GPS? Certainly. With GPS, I have the latitude and longitude of both the transmitter and the receiver. And using the Haversine algorithm, which I just looked up online, you can calculate the distance between any two points on Earth. All you need is the latitude and longitude of each point and the radius of the Earth. Do flat earthers believe in GPS? I don't know. Comment below if you know what flat earthers believe about GPS. But this formula does work with the given radius of the Earth. With this formula, I can take two GPS points and convert them into a distance and provide that to the receiver. This means that the receiver can move around continuously and check its distance to the transmitter. I put all this into my own app. Then I challenge my friends Ian and Megan to hunt me down using this app to see just how easy this device actually is to use. I gave them the receiver while I had the transmitter. It says you're 13 feet away at the moment. I think because I was standing over there. Gotcha. And now I'm over here and I don't have the app running right now. Okay. We set some ground rules before starting. I might be somewhere where um, oh. that that I'm not going to be like underground or like on a third story okay. or something right, like right. that. If he's you find, on the roof. He's on the roof. No. He's in the bushes. No. Then I got their initial thoughts about the chase. So how do you yes. two think you're going to do today? It depends on my navigation here. Uh, my driving skills are A1. Yeah. Um, my navigator here, that's what I'm relying on. As long as we have good communication, I think we're, uh, do your eyes work properly? I have astigmatism. Oh, okay, so we have half of us, our eyes work fine. It'll be fine. Yeah, it'll be fine. fine. I, I, all jokes aside, I think it's going to be great. Okay. Yeah. I think we're going to need nails. Okay. Yeah. They gave me a two-minute head start. All right, are you ready to get ready? We're ready to get ready. Here we go. Three, two, one, go. Go. 